Can you hear me? Well, how are you? Yeah, this is the meeting. Good. Well, yeah. yeah. <laughs> Welcome to the meeting. Good morning. Hi, Jesse. How are you? Yeah, we okay. usually uh, have a, you know, about an hour and a half, and we talk about all different things. This week, we'll talk about the submissions that we've made to different places. So I have to wait for a couple other people to get here before we start. So. All right. I'm in the midst of uh, changing and uh, moving, and, and my, my mother is here to uh, be a mom about it. So <laughs> if you hear stuff in the background or see me, if I go away, it might be related to that. But okay. Hello. Pierce, is that it? Yeah, that's right. Uh, good to see you here. Uh, you. Did I miss anything? Or were you guys just chatting? Just chatting. I mean, uh, this is his first meeting. I, I see we've got a lot of activity on the uh, Slack channel this week. <laughs> it's been a busy week. It's been a huge week. Yeah. Yeah, I think that's we did a lot of pretty good work this week, uh, just submitting things. And everyone, I, I think I'm going to go through a lot of the submissions one by one to review where we are. And then, um, you know, I think that'll be a good cap. Uh, I think we have like five out of six out of the six categories for Neuromatch are represented by <laughs> people in the group here. <laughs> so that's good. Yeah. Because I think, I think the Devo Wormish one was B or C or A. I don't know. Yeah. Then we have D, F. I know where Shops was B, I think. Mm -hmm. So I think that's, yeah. Yeah, I, I don't remember the one that we're missing, but <laughs> but no, it was pretty good. I mean, it was like, um, so, I mean, we'll go over those. And the next step, of course, is to make presentations for them, so. And that's something that if Piyush wants to be involved in, he can be. Um, I mean, yeah. We just, yeah. <laughs> just, you know, we always try to, like, include people if they want to be, uh, have some authorship. They usually do something, like, contribute a, a thing to the, you know, thing that's going out of the paper or presentation. So, but it gives people a good hands-on for uh, what's going on in terms of research, the mechanics. And then... Uh, you know, we do it. We uh, do this stuff in the meeting, so you won't see it this week, but you'll see it in subsequent weeks. How we kind of walk through maybe a paper or a outline or something, and kind of go through. Okay. Yeah. Mm. yeah um, I don't know what you wanted. I don't have like a presentation fixed for anything today, um, Bradley, but I mean, I can go over the, it'd be good to talk about the Stanford conference and then everything about the submissions, uh, because there's a, there's like a lot of all of stuff, uh, for the conference, the Stanford conference that, that was, that was a big surprise. And I can, I can rail on that for an indefinite period of time. So just let me know what you want me to I think we have a lot of business to take care of, and I yeah. don't want to. I don't want to take away from that. But outside of that, there's things to talk about. I think, yeah, we should. Talk, you know what you could do for the Stanford conference is to pull up your pull up the Slack channel. And, <laughs> yeah. yeah. My fast notes on that. Yeah, because yeah. you did put a lot of stuff in there, and that's actually a pretty nice summary because you have like a lot of screenshots and. That's actually the easiest way for me to take notes on this because yeah, yeah. if they give me the slides, it's different. But I don't know. I don't know if that's going to happen. So I think it, I know it's on YouTube, but I mean, I took I, I did it mostly for myself, like like Tenenbaum's presentation and Aldo Olivier's Olivier, like pretty much the same thing as the, the summer school for MIT, the BMM MIT BMM summer school. It's really they're really the same thing. Josh actually updated a bit more. But it was for the new people and new ways to talk about stuff. I don't know how much you saw, but like the first panel's debate with, with Chelsea and the Dan guy 
uh, like the roboticist and the guy who's totally digital simulation, computational. Um, that was, I really liked how people, there was a really nice, it was a really nice conversation because those are sort of the two poles of certain things. And they had like sort of a debate in the panel and it was referenced by the later panel too. So it was a lot of, a lot of really good swirling talk about uh, stuff we're interested in, so. Yeah, yeah, definitely. I did catch some of it on uh, YouTube and I mean, you know, the, you know, you have the talks and the panels and I, I thought a lot of the top topical information there was relevant. Mm. So. So I don't know if other people are going to show up, maybe a little bit late, but in any, in any case, welcome to the meeting. Um, if you're not here, we are on YouTube. We record and put on you. We put this on YouTube later in the day, and then it's there for people to see offline because we have people all over the world uh, potentially viewing our meeting. So uh, if you're viewing offline, uh, you can talk, you know, you can bring something up in Slack from the meeting or whatever. But um, today we're going to talk about a couple things. So this week was there were a lot of submissions to different. Uh, to Neuromatch to the different tracks, and I'll go over those, and then also talk about the Neurops workshops that we submitted to. So we submitted to two Neurops work workshops, the Baby Minds workshop and the Shared Representations workshop, and so I'll talk about those a little bit too. Uh, then I'll I'll maybe talk about Neuromatch, a plan of attack for that, and then uh, we also. I mentioned last week we might do a blog post so uh i basically what i'm thinking of on that is that we want to have some sort of presence during our match um i know it might be a lot of work but uh <laughs> and yeah i might drive that oh. forward oh here's akshara hi akshara uh we might drive that forward um but i mean basically the plan is to have a presence during neural match on social media uh, just kind of, and I'm sure Jesse will, <laughs> and others will tweet a lot about this, uh, about what's going on at no match. Uh, so that's, that's good too. Um, and then Jesse wants to talk about the, uh, Stanford HAI. We might do the Stanford HAI thing in the middle. Um, yeah, whenever it's good to have, if you want to, whatever fits best for that, um, yeah. Uh, I would say yes, also the grading thing I'm still doing, it's just this week got subsumed with submissions and also I'm moving. Yeah. So I'm, 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 I want that to stabilize. Basically, what I'm, honestly, what I'm going to be doing this for the next few days, including like Monday, which is the holiday here, is packing. And then my, when I'm tired of moving around, I'm going to be writing. So that's, that's, my, <laughs> that's my plan for the next several days. Um, oh, and I'm still going to do, I, I still have my own personal Neuromatch Academy blog that is coming to, which we can put out in the midst of all this, but I also definitely want to do, I don't know what you, I didn't know what you meant specifically by blog, but like, there's a lot of stuff to, to do. So whatever, I'm happy to, to help all that okay. happen. All right. Yeah. We'll talk about that in a little bit. So we have a new member here, uh, Piyush, and he's, uh, well, could you introduce yourself, Piyush? Yeah, hello, uh, my name is Piyush. I'm currently an undergrad at National Institute of Technology, Amirpur. And I'm in my senior undergrad year, and currently I'm studying computer and engineering. And recently I got interested in computation neuroscience. So. That's why I'm trying to learn more about it and uh, create more ideas and look for like um, yeah, that's what the point is. Well, welcome, and uh, you know we've interacted in Slack a bit, so mm -hmm. please, if you have something you want to uh, get involved in or bring up or something, you can bring it up in the Slack channels. Yeah. So, uh, Akshara, how are you doing today? Yeah. It's a good weekend here. The climate is so good. 
Anything. You're welcome. Okay, uh, well, do we have any other comments or questions before we begin? All right, well, let's get started on some of the stuff. So this week, we, of course, had the NeuroMatch deadline, and it was extended a week. So I think it gave people an opportunity to put some paper or some submissions in. So we had to submit a abstract, and I had a couple people come to me, Akshar, and, and actually someone from the Diva Worm group, uh, to have them look over abstracts. And so I did that, and we got feedback, and we got them all in, and uh all the abstracts, I think, except, you know, for the films that were obviously not <laughs> relevant to anything, were accepted. So we got a lot of acceptances here, and I'm going to walk through those. And then I'm going to uh, talk about the NeurIPS uh, submissions. And uh, so let me share my screen. So the first step here is to recognize that the abstracts and the submissions and then the next step, of course, is to work these into um, finished products. So this is the fall submissions. Uh, so we had, uh, I think, five out of the six categories at NeuroMatch represented. So there are six categories going in. Uh, I'll go over the, each one with each submission. So the first one is the one we talked about uh, in the group this is i think most of the people in the group are on the in the group meetings currently are on this uh approaching artificial intelligence as an embodied developmental process and this is the one with the Breedenberg vehicles and the developmental stages and the critical period stuff so um this is the one that also kind of is the uh shorter version of the baby baby minds paper uh, this was an, uh, accepted actually in theme D, cognition, motivation, and emotion. And I think originally, maybe, I think Jesse came to me and asked me where we should submit this, what track. And I couldn't really think about what track it was because it was like, could it be computation? Could it be cognition? Could it be development? Yeah. I, I submitted it originally. I was actually, originally I was going to do D. I may have actually first submitted it as D, but then I resubmitted it. I got everybody's um, authorship and name information on there. And the final draft of it all, uh, I put it in F, or not F, the, um, the model, the, the computation one specifically. Yeah. And I think I put it back to that one. So okay. that's fine. I, it, it could be any, so many things. So. Yeah. I think, like, I know the development one wouldn't have been good because that's going to be more maybe developmental psychology or, <clears throat> you know, like biology, um, like wet lab biology. I think they actually do have a bit. I, I saw some of the other submissions going through the voting and uh, I saw a couple that were pretty, you know, biological. But, you know, this is supposed to be like a... a, a a, not a replacement for, but like a substitute for SFN. So you're going to get a lot of those people coming in and submitting. So I think given that, I think our, and then of course, a lot of computational people like where they're doing more traditional computational neuroscience. So I think maybe yeah. this is a good place for this. And uh, yeah, I think people will see it either way. I mean, you know, <laughs> uh, you know, I think we're going to actually end up recording these sessions. So they're just going to be somewhere in the schedule. And then I think they're going to get promoted independently of that. So once we have the slides in the talk, then we can promote it, you know, in, almost independently of the session. But yeah, I'm a little, I'm curious how that's going to work because they did, they mandated we did pre recorded things in one of the inner matches. And another they mandated we didn't do it. Um, so, I mean, that'll be interesting. The slides and the promotion will be good. And I think we have, we have time to do, there'll be a lot to do, but we'll to do it. yeah, well, I think the, this one is going to be different because there's so many submissions that, you know, you might have a slot that is like the middle of the night just so they can fit everyone in. And so it might be that you, uh, have to record it. <laughs> 
But so that was theme B. Then the psychophysics of non-neuronal cognition. So this is the one that was sort of more deworm oriented. And I have people from that group. I have Akshara on it and I have myself and I think Jesse's on it from this group. And then a couple of people from the deworm group. And then this is, of course, the talk about the basal area, which I showed last week, the colonies, uh, videos of the colonies. And so this is a paper about a computational model surrounding the movement of these organisms, these colonies. And uh, for this, you know, this talk, it's not going to be that deeply. Uh, we're going to have to do a lot of hardcore work for it. Just, you know, lay out the concept and then maybe propose some sort of model. And that'll be something we can work out in the lab meetings. Maybe next week and the week after, because it's, only about three weeks away. So we're going to have to hurry up on this stuff. Uh, this was submitted to theme B, which is neural excitability, synapses, and glia. And again, I think given what the top, what, what's actually going on with the movement, I think that's a good category. Uh, it does kind of issue, bring, raise issues of excitability, excitable cells and uh, synapses, although we're not really talking about traditional synapses. But synapses is like the uh, the interface between cells, you know, that's the idea. And so I think it'll fit into that category. And again, like this category isn't optimal, but I don't know how much the themes are going to mean. I mean, you're just going to be grouped with a bunch of other talks, but, um, you know, again, we'll promote this separately from the other stuff. This is uh, the third one. That, this is actually Rashab and some people he's been working with. I included it because, so the idea here is I want to show all these talk names and make sure people know what they are so that they can uh, vote for them if they have the opportunity. So I don't know who received emails about voting for abstracts, but, uh, you know, vote for these if you want to see them. <laughs> uh, I think the voting is... Uh, Sorry. Or, go ahead. Oh, go ahead. Oh, the voting is uh, just, I think, a way for them to figure out which ones are more interesting to the people, and then they do the scheduling accordingly or something like that. Yeah, I, I think, think they, they prioritize those time slots um, to, to, to more accessible ones. And uh, just a shout out to anybody who is watching and hasn't signed up for Neuromatch. You can sign up now, I believe, until at least one or two more weeks from now. Um, and if you sign up, you can vote. Uh, and the fee, there's a $25 fee if you can pay it. And if not, you can just say, I can't pay it. And you still get it. So it's very accessible. And, and I really appreciate that they've done that. Um, it's very, very intentionally designed to be very accessible. So. Yeah. Yeah, so that's, uh, this is seeing through the mind's eye reconstructing of the visual stimuli using 3D generative adversarial modeling. So this is a, a machine learning paper. Uh, so this was actually submitted to theme E, computational modeling and techniques. So there's another category. Uh, this one also is computational modeling and techniques. Uh, this one is actually uh, someone from the Divorm group Krishna Katyal and myself. And it's this contrast between biological and artificial neural network. And so this one is basically a talk about the differences between artificial neural networks and biological neural networks. And, uh, you know, the idea I told them, you know, when doing something this broad in a small talk, one successful strategy is to pick a couple things that you want to talk about that are differences and then focus on those. So there are a lot of di potential differences um, and uh, there are obvious differences and maybe not so obvious differences. And so the way that talk would work would be we'd kind of go over the like maybe one slide or two slides of the obvious differences <laughs> just to recap for people. And then later in the talk, you drill down to like maybe two or three differences that you don't think are 
uh, you don't think of all the time, but they're there. And just talk about those. So I think he talks about in here um, that there, you know, there's a there are a lot of connectivity rules that are um, different. You have uh, some other energetic constraints. So there are things in there that are uh, that we can focus on that are not obvious when people think about the differences between the two kinds of networks, but um so i mean that'll be that'll be another talk that's also in computation then this is one that akshara and myself are on um this is one that she wants to do it's a computational model so this is overcompensation of lens accommodation in case of convergence and sufficiency a theoretical model this is theme c uh this is another theme so this is sensory motor systems and physiology behavior. So this is a model of non-strabismic binocular vision anomaly. So this is uh, something that happens in this is ad adaptive accommodation excess. So this is a, something that happens, you know, it's more of a clinical thing that you observe. And this is a computational model and we're going to, I think we're going to work out some sort of model for this, uh, you know, and, and again, like it doesn't have to be super technical and it shouldn't really be super technical. It should be, you know, laying out the basics of the model, uh, what goes into the model. It might actually be more useful to say, like, you know, to give sort of an, uh, maybe an overview of the, what's in the model. It may be, you know, it doesn't have to be something really elegant. Usually when people present models, they say, this is the model, they put up an equation or a set of equations where they do a simulation and it's not very nice, but that's a finished product. Uh, that's not necessarily what we want here. We want, and this is a theoretical model, so it's a bit different than that. What we wanna do is just kind of focus on the, the components of the model. So what makes the model feasible. Um, it could be like uh, ideas. It could be like how they're connected together. It could provide like a small diagram of things. And then, you know, uh, future work. How do we get to a more sort of predictive model or is it a representational model? And so that that's the, and this also holds true for the uh, non neuronal cognition paper as well. You know, we don't want to go into this thing and say, we're going to present this uh, polished model because you don't really have one. I mean, <laughs> the idea of these talks is to get people interested in the topic and put together like a, you know, a plan for the future. Maybe uh, if we have some things that are firmed up, you know, kind of show those. But I think that's, I think that'll be good. And I think these slots are like 15 minutes or 20 minutes. I don't think they're too much more than that. Yeah, I would, I would ask the people here, did you guys make traditional talks or interactive talks? Because either way, you kind of are capped at 15 minutes, I think. And it's just like one of them is a shorter talk with more questions and one of them is a longer talk with less question time. And there's going to be a lot. There's honestly, like, thinking about the the uh, developmental AI one like that's that's gonna be a lot to cover in even ten minutes of time so it'd have to be this will be sort of interesting communication uh, demo demo or die sort of uh, talks yeah I think I think that's true uh, I record the I'm sorry I'm sorry that's okay go ahead uh, I. It is funny that it is not. Oh. Uh, what, what, do you have, what was the question? Uh, he just asked if, uh, if, if, if who chose traditional talks and the interactive talks. Um, yeah. Oh, did you? What did you say though? I didn't. I don't know if I heard what you said. I was just trying to say, but then like uh, I intruded badly, so I just stopped. 
Yeah, I don't know if we have the details on the actual timing yet. I mean, like we'll we'll get the details and everything on how exactly they want us to do it. So, uh, but you know, it's it's yeah, it's it's worth thinking about a little bit now, and then when we get the details, uh, let's see. Let me go back to the submissions. Okay. Uh, so that was the that was that talk, and then the final talk is uh, Jesse and Anson, and so this is one that I think is more drawn from their stuff with the discussion groups that they're involved in. It says trajectories and cognition studies focus on embodiment and future frontiers, and so this is the stuff that Jesse is uh, talking about in the Slack channels, or he's talked about in this meeting, where he's looking at sort of the history of cognitive science, uh, where it's going, where it's been, and, and uh, Anson is going to be involved in this as well. So, you know, it's like a lot of philosophy of science, a lot of history. The study of cognition contains a vast set of tributaries flowing from traditional fields of cognitive science. Uh, what is missing is following the last several decades of cognitive of the cognitive revolution. It's a question. Uh, in this talk, we look at relevant trajectories in the philosophy behind inquiries into cognitive capacity and functioning, the concept of embodiment, uh, and then into specific arenas such as cognitive neuroscience and computational cognitive science. So that's good. Uh, it's very short, nice and short. Uh, uh, it's theme F, so this is a different theme. This is history, education, and society. Yes. Um, I, I I wish I could update. I hope I get a chance to update the abstract. I, kind of, I wish I had a little bit more chance before, even before the voting. I mean, I don't, I'm, honestly, I'm not. I don't think a bunch of people are going to undergo for this. And I, I, I'm, not, I'm not trying to become a, vo a voguer on this one in particular. However, um, I wish... I wish two things. I have two wishes for this. One is that I can update the abstract in general. That's how I felt. Um, and, and as a cap, as a as a side note, um, I, I I reached out to the what what is called the interdisciplinary humanities group at Western Michigan University, where Anson is. Okay. And uh, we we we. we that's the group that we've been doing kind of a journal club. We focus a tremendous amount on embodiment, but it's totally from, they're a bunch of philosophers. They're not computational people. So I was kind of, I was kind of trying to keep it, the door open enough so they could do more on this or join in. And there was something there, but it didn't quite, it was sort of a, it didn't quite come to full fruition. Um, uh, but um, it, it, it was, I'll definitely be acknowledging them because they they they've done so much stuff. We had a, we had a really good discussion this week. Um, in that, um, as a side note, the second wish is I wish the Stanford uh, comps, I'll talk about it later today. But the Stanford uh, Human Human Centered AI Conference about triangulating intelligence. Like if I I wish I saw that first, so that was beforehand because I would I would add quite a bit to it. Thankfully, my presentation will be enhanced by that when I do give it, but it, it, it's, it's really, I, I, it's really something that the mention of embodiment in parts of the conference was much different. I included embodiment originally in the abstract because it's something we've been talking about quite a bit in different groups that I've been in. And it's sort of like an interesting, I won't say, fr it's not a fringe concept, but like it's, it can be very philosophical and heady and whatever else. And I was like, okay, you know, I'm going to kind of try to tangent, try to make it a little more concrete and, and put the context of history and trajectory to cognitive science, which is something we're really interested in, as people who know from other things I'm doing. Okay. But then the, the, the upcoming conference sort of, the Stanford conference that I mentioned, like happened to like just point at it directly like, oh yeah, this is really important. So it, it kind of went from, uh, it kind of went from, here's a, here's kind of a, a almost fuzzy topic that's sort of like, oh, well, philosophical and, you know, to people at really high level saying, 
yeah, yeah. Gibson's of course is an embodiment really uh, and, and and direct perception is like really important what we're trying to do in the future of AI. It's like okay. So more about that to come. But um that was this very interesting uh plot twist from this week. So that's it. Yeah. Well let me go through the uh NERP submissions, and then we'll talk a little bit more about this, how to do the, the next step on this. Hmm. So uh, submissions, so those are the uh, neur or the, the NeuroMatch submissions. And uh, congratulations, everyone, for getting to this step. Uh, it's, it is hard to write up uh, abstract, uh, you know, to get everything kind of in organized and in a short you know, paragraph or something where you can describe to people what you're trying to do. And so I think all these are very different in, in different ways. And I think they're all very, potentially very good. Now that's, you know, that's going to be, so you're going to have to produce a talk on that, of course, now. Uh, and then don't worry too much about the voting. I mean, the voting will be, I think, maybe an ego boost, but I don't think... <laughs> Other than that, I think it's just really going to be like, you know, make a good quality presentation because these are ideas that you uh, are invested in somewhat. So, you know, um, show off your stuff and, you know, then we'll have it, I think, video recorded. So it'll be something that you can use as a future tool for uh, maybe driving this forward a bit more. So... We also submitted two things to NeurIPS, uh, the the workshops at NeurIPS. The main NeurIPS uh, submission is closed, uh, but we did have two papers that uh, were submitted. So the first one was the Baby Minds paper. That was the main submission we talked about last week. So this is the final product. This So we were writing, we were working on this in Word and doing edits and talking about things in Slack. And then uh, I took that document and I put it into uh, a f the format that we had to submit it in. So I used uh, Overleaf for that. I, I worked on a, a LaTeX file and compiled it a couple times and I was having some trouble compiling uh, the LaTeX file because that's the way it works. And uh, I was able to get it all ready and it, it should be fine. So this is the submission, the first submission. This is for the Baby Minds Workshop, Bio-Inspired Embodied Continual Learning Across Developmental Time. That's the title. I think we were talking about the title last week a lot, and that's the title that we have as a submitted title. Uh, you know, I think that's pretty good. Um, and then we have six authors on it. So myself, Rashab, Akshara, Anson, Furkan, and Jesse. And so again, those are people who provided significant input and will in the it's alphabetized. So, you know, I always feel kind of like my name is it my last name starts with an A, so I feel like I'm like always first, but you know, that's uh sometimes I like to, you know, use other conventions, but for now we'll just use the alphabetical convention. Uh, and the abstract is nice, I think nice and short. I know Jesse and I were going back and forth on that a bit. And so uh, with uh, Rashab as well. Uh, and then the paper I think is about, well, I can open the paper actually. So this is the main paper. So it's pretty good. I mean, we have our sections here. We motivate the problem and we have the methodological perspective. So we ended up in artificial genetics and environment and potential for reinforcement learning. And so these things are uh, sort of laid out in the appendix. I just put like short paragraphs in the main paper because we had like five, four to five pages, I think four pages. Yeah, so it ends here. So we had four pages that we could have for the main body of the paper. So we go through these methodological perspectives. We go through a contingency analysis, which is really more of a discussion of the different things that you could do experimentally. We haven't, we don't have like results for this 
in the paper, but um, I think that was enough. And then the discussion, which is very short, and then the appendix, which has artificial genetics and environment. So this is largely about the DBVs and Gibsonian information. And I'd like to actually flesh that out at some point, uh, this idea of Gibsonian information. It's something that we haven't really, we've talked a little bit about, but it's, uh, I think it's useful. Um, I decided not to cut it because I think it is an, an important concept at least, but there's uh, no real theory behind it yet. Jesse, you were going to say something? Um, just, I, I, general positivity towards the paper and I'm, I'm glad Gibson's in there. And I, I think whether or not this gets accepted to NeurIPS, um, you know, I think the paper, at least for me and what I'm going to be doing in the next several months in the lab, I think I'm going to, like this paper really serves a lot of, there's a really, there's really a lot, uh, like, like a prism. When you put the lights for this paper, there's a lot of like really amazing stuff that I'm excited to work on. So I'm glad that it came out. I appreciate everybody working on it. Um, I think we could submission and I'm glad, I'm glad what's in there is in there. <clears throat> yeah. And I like your prism metaphor. <laughs> I think that's true. And that's, I mean, that's typically what we're going to have. Like, I think when you write a paper, it happens a lot. You have a lot of ideas that kind of come together and you don't really you know, they're unfinished in the sense that they're not really fully formed, but you put them in there because you it kind of supports what you're doing. And then later you go back and you say, oh, yeah, there's an idea that we need to write another paper on. So it's usually like an iterative process. You get some ideas out. Sometimes the ideas are of lesser importance in one paper, and then that leads to the basis for another paper. So, you know, this stuff with the uh, developmental Bradenburg vehicles, these DBVs, you know, we've been working, we had it one pa the original paper was, uh, you know, in January or February where we put it out. And that was from the work that we did last year on it. And it introduced a lot of topics that were, um, you know, not fleshed out in the paper so much, but uh, ended up getting fleshed out in, in a couple subsequent uh, pieces of work that were now the the artificial life conference paper which was the summer and then these two submissions the neuro neuromatch and the neurips submission so i think that's good um you know again we're just drawing on things and doing further research and kind of bringing things together in new ways so uh again then there's the reinforcement learning section which was rashab uh we got a couple paragraphs there but again this is just food for future thought. We wanted to kind of expound upon this idea of reinforcement learning because it's pretty obvious maybe to this group that this this uh, baby minds group, you know, we go in and we give a talk and be, their question will be, how does this connect to reinforcement learning? So we'll have like a couple of paragraphs in the paper. And then I, I wrote a broader impact statement, which is something you do at NeurIPS. And this broader impact statement is usually like a, a short statement on the pros and cons of your work. So, um, you know, there's some drawbacks, there's some advantages. Um, and then the references, uh, so we had 33 references altogether. Uh, I think it was, they're pretty diverse references. Um, and I talked to Jesse about creating a, and I think we, I don't know if we talked about this last week, maybe it was just in Slack, uh, creating a, a bibliography for it. So like, you know, we might do this in, we were, we were talking about doing it in um, Zotero, but we could use another platform. It basically wants something that is, you know, free to use for people. I think that's good. Um, you know, something that like, something you don't need an institutional account for, or you have to pay a lot of money for, because we have contributors, you know, we have people in the group, you know, undergrads, we have people who are in academic environments. So, you know, they don't have access to some of these things. And so I want to make it, uh, you know, open and accessible and then something that can scale. So if we put in a bunch of references, 
you know, we don't hit a hard limit on what we can do. So I think Zotero might work. I think just not having the papers in there and just having a collection of like just formatted references would be sufficient. But I think that's good for like, if we're doing, like I said, if we go to uh, think about a topic for another paper and we have all these references already, then it's always, you know, we can go look and see what we cited in that paper for this topic. And then, you know, use that as the basis for a new paper. And, you know, it kind of, it makes it easier because you can then, you know, oh yeah, that's right. We cited these papers and this is what we got out of it. So we'll go back and maybe look at those papers. And um, there are all, all, also tools uh, like forward citation. So one of the things you can do when you have a paper that you really like is go to uh, Google Scholar and or just search for the paper on Google. And uh, when you search the paper on Google, there will be under the entry, it'll say cited by a certain number of people. So like cited by 164. And you, you click on that link and it gives you this list of people or papers that are had been had cited that paper. So it's a forward citation. So it's like since that paper came out, there have been a bunch of papers since then that have cited that paper. What are they? And it gives you a good idea of wh where that paper has gone in terms of its influence. So, you know, it might be like something like um, the Mathematical Theory of Communication uh, by Claude Shannon. That's a very well known paper. We've talked about Shannon's information theory. And so that paper, I think, has been cited like 8,000 times. So you go back and you can actually see the citations from the original paper. And it's, you know, they're just a massive number of citations and all these different fields. But it all came back to that one paper in terms of their influence, at least part of their influence. So that's something actually Jesse might think about for his, uh, for his, uh, 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 trajectories and cognition as a tool for showing how the influence of papers and things like that. Um, yeah, um, I actually saw there was a um, a I don't know, colleague of mine on LinkedIn uh, shared something about a, there's a Coursera course on bibliometrics and some other sort of things um, that I might be looking at for that. Because uh, I know, like, as you guys may recall from talking about it before, like, the, there's the famous uh, or infamous Nunes paper, What Happened to Cognitive Science, which is kind of a bibliometric approach and looking at some things like that. So between that and what, you know, what Bradley's saying, and, like, I'm definitely planning on doing that for my, one of my longer term, I don't know, personal projects, pet projects, is that what they call them now? Um, uh, and also like, specifically for the lab, this is kind of a slight segue into lab manager with my lab manager. I didn't have a lab manager. I'm inspired from Neuromatch and have a lab manager hat so I can be like, identify when I'm, I'm saying these comments. But, um, yes, I think that was kind of the previous week with big focus on Zotero and, and stuff. And that's an open thing that, um, I may be. For people who are looking for ways to contribute to the lab, that would be one of them. Um, like just for, like the, like some of our major papers, helping to flesh out the big lab before using Zotero, getting Zotero set up. Um, and it's very easy to kind of just get, especially if we do it without, I think doing it without the, just getting the references themselves and, and we, papers are sort of their own deal and, 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 and they can be acquired um, and, and, and given as needed. You don't, we don't have to download them all and put them all in Zotero. I think that's, I think I'm, I'm, I'm pretty much saying that's not a good way to use Zotero for our purposes. However, just as a collective way to easily com create com com combined reference sets, I think that's a, a really important thing to do um, just for ease of writing papers and then also getting to what Bradley said about talking about stuff. So if people are interested in that, um, or people who are here see that and we're like, hey, uh, you know, I want to, I want to do something in, in the lab. And this is a bit more data management, uh, maybe not data science, but like this is more of a, the legwork of of stuff. But if you're interested in it, you know, there's, 
I'm setting links up there. Also, on a semi-related note, there's been some talk about uh, GitHub organizations and, and GitHub management. Um, and I have a lot of ideas. I know Rish has contributed to some of those ideas as well. And and we're not talking about that now. I know we didn't plan on talking about that now, but um, I, I think I think it will be cool to have uh, my one plug for it right now is having a GitHub organization will be a cool way to show uh, on your profile when people come and visit it. Because I, I realize like there's views where you, if you have it, I'll, I'll show this when I'm talking presenting later. But it's a cool way to show, hey, I'm involved in this organization, and you could just easily see all the contributions you made to the different repos in that organization. And I think that would be a really useful thing for people in the lab to show. The, other people or potential employers or whatever. So, I mean, there's, we want to maintain the legacy. I, I very much understand that for links and references and all that stuff. Um, but I think, I think there are some ways to, to get the best of both worlds in that. So, yeah. Yeah. Okay. We'll talk about that in a minute. Let me finish up yeah. on some of these. Uh... So this is the, so our, this is a, uh, uh... NeurIPS workshop. So this is going to be held in concurrence with NeurIPS, but the submission system is separate. And we were submission number three. So this was submitted on October 2. So this was submitted before the deadline was extended. And so there may be more papers now, but I think if there we were three, so I think we're pretty good, have a pretty good chance of being accepted. Not just that the paper is good, but that there are maybe a lot of submissions. Uh, we updated it a couple times after the second, but um, you know, just so that we know. At, uh, yeah. At, At the, the same, same time, time, like, frankly, every nurse is like, you know, huge as it is, but I, I'm pretty sure like, this is the one that Gary Marcus is doing. Yep. And I think Tenenbaum might even be participating in as well. So like, maybe those, those are, are like people that are really interesting to me. So I'm happy yeah. about that. So the second one is this uh, observer-dependent collective behavior for biologically inspired processing models. And this uh, is this ended up being, let's see, myself, Jesse, and Ojwal Singh, who's uh, collaborated a lot with Evil Worm, but also presented in this group a couple weeks ago on a, on a submission or a paper that he was working on. So uh, this is... This this is for the shared representations workshop, and again, this had a later deadline. Uh, this is again is concurrent with NeurIPS, but isn't uh, part of their submission process. And so we have the abstract here, the introduction. This was submission twenty three, and this was submitted close to their deadline. So, you know, uh, I don't know, we may have less of a chance of getting in, but I think they're. Acceptance rate is like 60%, so we'll see. Um, again, so this is the shared representations paper. This is we have three authors right now, um, the abstract, the introduction. So this is the paper that Jesse and I submitted to another conference uh, earlier this year, got rejected um, just because, I mean, it wasn't in very good shape at that point. I mean, it was basically, you know, this is a extended abstract. So it's kind of hard to get a lot of the concepts flushed out. And I think in this version, the concepts are much more flushed out and to be accessible. It might be a better fit overall too. Yeah. Um, yeah. So I, I think this is, I'm, I'm happy to see this paper here. I think it's come a ways. You really, you changed, you did, you added a lot to it in the last sort of round of revisions or, or last week. So thank you for that. Um, but I think it's, I think it's a really cool, um, it's, 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 it's something to be fleshed out more and more and intent and make con more concrete in things for sure. But like, I think the concepts there are really exciting. Yeah, I think so too. So, I mean, briefly, this is a paper on, uh, it's basically the idea of you have a world and you have uh, the idea is that we want to have observers of that world, and we want to focus on the role of observers in observing the world. So in this case, we've focused it down to like data, uh, like input data for like an machine learning algorithm or something like that. 
and we're using observers explicitly as like sort of a pre-processing or pre-trained model layer to observe things. And so, you know, observe the uh, data from different perspectives. And so we focus on the observer, we focus on the different perspectives, but more importantly, um, we model those observers as this, uh, having a, a genome and having a genome to phenotype model. And so that model allows us to encode things in a genome, an artificial genome that uh, allows them to be like diverse and have like different capabilities as well as observing things from different perspectives. It's a bit, it's a bit much, it's a bit kind of a hard concept to describe in one sentence, uh, which they actually asked for in the submission uh, portal, by the way, but I think I got a good sentence out of it. Uh, but yes, it's basically multi-agent algorithms. It, it, it fits into that area. Uh, there's active sampling. There's other, you know, there are sort of parallels with other computational tools. So it's definitely this version, I think, has, uh, it's much more sort of grounded in, like, the literature grounded in more, of, uh, I think, a state more stable footing than the other version. Uh, we have this one figure, which is a panel figure. So it kind of lays out what the agents look like. Uh, the epistatic model, which is where you have this genomic representation that interacts with uh, hidden layers, which represent sort of the expression of this genomic representation. And then this uh, sensory layer, which interacts with the environment. And there's, you know, uh, recurrence between the sensory inputs and then the regulation of the genomic representation. And that gives you like this, uh, and then you can, uh, have, you have these stimuli that are, you know, you can uh, transform them in terms of perspective. And that gives you like different, inf a lot of uh, alternate information about your data set. And so that's sort of analogous to what people do with data augmentation, but it's much richer than that. And so we discussed that. And so the paper again is, I think, four to five pages, the main paper, and then the appendix has a bunch of technical details. So we described this uh, GDP architecture. I actually went back to a paper, uh, a similar paper that I wrote about over 10 years ago now and kind of summarized some of that material. And that's where a lot of the additions came from. Uh, and then, so we have some, so the technical detail is I think helpful to understanding what's going on. Again, another broader impact statement, which was the basically what the pros and cons of the current work. Um, and then the references, we actually have more references for this than the Baby Minds papers, 36. And so this has um, a lot of different, a very diverse reference list. So um, this is something that if it doesn't get accepted, I think it's in a lot better shape than it was. So, you know, we might end up... Um, you know, we might end up submitting that somewhere else too. Okay. Ash said that was so well written, the Baby Minds paper. Um, so yeah, so I guess um, that's the submissions. I just wanted to say that we had, uh, I, I was gonna talk a little bit about the presentations, but that's, I think just a couple words on presentations. So now, from now until I think Neuromatch starts the last week of October. We have to work on some presentations. And I would, I'm going to put more information in Slack about this, but I would suggest that people uh, just work on, like, come up with some slides that describe your idea. They don't have to be like, it doesn't have to be word for word. You don't have to just cut and paste words, but, you know, kind of come up maybe with some visual representations of what you want to talk about. Um, diagrams, pictures, um, and then kind of fill in the blanks. And we'll we'll have in the next two weeks. We'll have I'll set aside some time for people to present um, their work in the meeting or talk about what they want to present. So that's uh, and then maybe I'll just talk about this briefly, and then I'll let Jesse talk about. Uh, Stanford, H-A-I. -H -H 
So let me actually share my screen again. Oops. I think Ash had a weave. So, but this is just a quick thing about the. Uh, so the Neuromatch Academy. I mentioned that we might do a blog post on the comp complexity of feedback loops project, and so I'm so interested in doing that. Uh, this is a kind of a place in, in GitHub for this. I don't know. The only thing I know I want to do, and I don't have any rules for this, is that I want to have like some sort of presence during the conference. So I thought it might be a good I, I, opportunity to, do, to sort of highlight that idea or that project. Maybe people want to get involved or something. Uh, but also, you know, Jesse said he has some things that he might post on Neuromatch and more generally in terms of a blog post. So I, I'll turn it over to Jesse now. Yeah, um, I, I think, think I, I would, would... My stuff is kind of emotion already, um, but anybody who's, who's new, anybody who's been in Neuromatch or would be interested in contributing, like having a presence, um, anybody who, even if they're very new to the lab or considering joining the lab or whatever, like there's there's some opportunities for involvement there. Like if you're interested in the Neuromatch blog post or making it, it, making something very, a lot of people, and I'll say, I'll raise my own hand in this, uh, if you want to, to make a project, whether it's a blog post or a presentation or start a paper on things related to Neuromatch and look for people to do it with or, or mentoring, like, like for people who don't know, Bradley was a mentor at Neuromatch Academy. Um, I was involved in, in it as well. And many, many people in the lab have been. So there's a, there's a, there's a great field of people here who are interested in these topics. Um, from aging to eye stuff to um, what, what, what was what's been submitted to Neuromatch conference. So general plug for that uh, call for involvement, if you will. And maybe maybe I'll write something about this and put it in Slack or or somewhere like just a general Neuromatch call for involvement for oral because there's there's so many people people I get a lot of like DMs in in Slack saying Hey Jesse I have this idea or uh, um, you know, I'm, I'm, I, I, I like this topic. Is there anything on this to do? And I would just say, yeah, combine it with either if you're submitting something to Neuromatch, um, or want to do an adjacent talk about it, go ahead. Or we can do at the very least, like at the very least, what we can absolutely do is have everybody write a couple paragraphs about what they're presenting at Neuromatch now. Cause I mean, we have. Seven people, I think, in the lab who are involved in the papers and having a nice, you know, a nice simple blog post where we do that, like that's that's like a very low hanging fruit that we, we should we should do. Um, but this it's a lot of other things to do as well. So reach out to me, reach out to Bradley, just say something in one of the Slack channels. Um, we have a neuromatch Slack channel specifically for it. We can make another one. Um, well. We have, we have plenty of means to do it. So just, that's my soapbox call for involvement. Um, I will talk about, I will talk about um, Stanford stuff next, but if there's anything else to be said before that, uh, let me know. I'll get that right now. Well, I just wanted to, I think, follow up on the organization, GitHub organization stuff. So. Yeah, I'm interested in it. I'm just trying to figure out how we might set it up. Like I said I didn't want to like take the whole thing and move it over as a clone because you know we have like repos we want to protect and and things. But I also want to have like I know that uh, we well you know this that we had the we have a Diva Worm uh, GitHub repo or GitHub. It's not an organization, but we do have an organization called Diva Learn, which is like a sort of a byproduct of our work in Devo Worm. And so that's a, a organized around a specific set of topics. And we might consider doing something like that for Orthogonal Lab, just kind of like, uh, maybe not like a different brand, but just kind of like, you know, specific things that we'll put in the uh, repos in, in the organization that, you know, maybe it's more active than the other, you know, so we have like this, um, 
Well, it's kind of like Evil Learn, where we have a, it's much more yeah. polished, maybe. And I, I, I was, was thinking, thinking like, like, like you could have they could. There's, there's different, different ways to do it. Like, like you, you could, could do it the whole. You could do like option A, which we're not going to do, which is just complete transfer to organization. And I think that's fairly reasonable uh, for what we talked about. There are a bunch of different options. And I'm going to couple, like one of them that I, that I thought of, and which is essentially the deep learn model, which is like have a specific project or at least project umbrella. And for us, maybe that's meta brains, you know, like that's, that's kind of the latest evolution. Maybe we make a specific meta brain thing there. We could also do, I don't know if we want to, or like um, oral slash neuromatch and keep with the neuromatch stuff as an organization. I don't know that that, that this is this top of my head stuff, but like having some specific projects, I think would be really good to kind of uh, I. I'm very, I don't want to create an excessive amount of fragmentations and categories of things. However, I think for something like the MetaBain project, which is kind of one of the biggest umbrella, major, major umbrellas in the lab right now, I think that's a really good thing to do for that. Um, because it will kind of show, when, when it's something's an organization, I feel like the organization has been using it on GitHub. And I, I, I kind of wish Rich was here because I think he has a little more, I think he's done more with that than I have. But like, I think it's a really great way to really highlight and isolate in a very easy to visualize way, not just having a macro repo, but like the way it appears and in, in how we're able to do and look at it and see where where things are and where things have been, I think is a, is a great way to show it. So it's almost like an enhanced project. Uh, I don't know. It's, a, it's, a, it, it's called an organization, but I almost feel like a better name for what it is in GitHub might be like project home um, because I don't know. People, can, I, people who know more about it and you could help can, can say that but anyway so yes that that's my thoughts about that um and i think i think that would be a really cool thing to do um and the way i don't know like i'll show I'll, if, if it's okay i'll start sharing my screen in general yeah man. um let me get this uh yeah okay let me get this here uh uh, da, 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 da. Here we go. I want to share the whole screen. Okay, so I think you can see stuff now. Um, really, I'm not signed into GitHub. Well, um, even even as this here, um, like you can see, I recently set up my 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 profile to show this. So, um, well, like you can see your contributions here, and then this is a really nice way to see it. You can see this when you set it up, when you set up to display your profile the right way, and it breaks it down by organization. I think it's a really powerful feature, not just for other people looking outside, but to see yourself what it is that you've been doing. Um, and so I think that's that's a really cool. I think that's, that's I think that's a powerful feature and a powerful way to visualize stuff. Um, and GitHub does that through organizations. Um, so just putting that out there, um, I'll go to Slack now. Okay. Um, let me, let me get this here. Um, uh, agenda. Yeah. Look at this here. Uh, so here's the homepage for Stanford Human Center Artificial Intelligence. Um, show me the conference page. Um, I guess I don't know where the conference page went on me, but here's the agenda here. Uh, this will do. The agenda was very cool. Oh, let's do the overview page. Um, okay. Well, I encourage people to, I'll put this in the chat. Um, the, the agenda was very good. I started off with Faye Faley, who I, who I kind of miss. Um, introduction section with Christopher Manning um, and, and Surya Ganguly. Um, 
this is very cool stuff. Uh, specific research talks, uh, Matt at DeepMind, Dan, uh, out professor at Stanford, um, and Chelsea. This is a really interesting, uh, if, if this, if this, uh, personally, I benefited from, I should probably say it like this. I thought this conference was going to be something I was going to watch as I was basically getting ready to move them in the background. It's like, Oh, you know, that's, that's cool. Um, but, and, and kind of listen to whatever, but I was intensely listening for basically seven hours in a row. Um, if you had to look at one thing, I'll look at the intros and the panel discussions. Um, and, and even catch a little bit, even catch a little bit at the end when they're doing their kind of closing remarks too. Uh, cause there was some really surprising stuff. Uh, like I really, I was really surprised what Bill Newsom said. So I know we're kind of at the end of the hour here, but just to go over a little bit of, uh, a little bit of stuff here. Um, this, this, can I do this? This slide was pretty cool. Um, and, and, uh, the, one of the opening talks was good. Um, and, and I wish I had the one before it, but, uh, I'm going to do it like this from the first general, uh, part of things. Um, uh, this morning session, afternoon session. I'm just going to go through some of the slides quickly here. Um, oh, these don't look that great. Uh, one of the one of the other things that happened was uh, there, there was there's a, there was a really strong. Oh, I know I'm, I'm all over the place here, but let me also pull up the the uh, symbolic systems from program. Uh, which is really interesting at Stanford. And it's kind of, um, they've had quite an, the, the discussion at Stanford today or at the, at the event was well, a very interesting mix of being particularly interested in, um, uh, hold on a second, actually, there's, there's a lot of noise here. So just one moment. Sorry about that. Um, uh, yeah. Um, so uh, th there's a really interesting combination of caring about symbolic systems and, and essentially some of the elements of AI that have been mm, neglected, if you will, versus a very strong catering to uh, a really interesting take on embodiment. Um, and I'll bring up some of my things here that came from it. Um, uh, but yeah, so like, uh, yeah. Um, from the start of it here, yes, I'm using Twitter, which is like the academic thing to do now. Um, this post, I, I referenced everybody looking at this post, which is sort of a, um, it's a combination post of, whoops, of a lot of things that are going on there. Oh, that's not actually the post. Sorry. Right. But there's a blog post that really goes into, um, what they're doing and what's been going on. Um, just to kind of be really, uh, there's so many things here, but I'm just going to narrow it down a few because I'm, I'm rambling a lot right now. Um, Yejin uh, was really interesting. She looked at uh, the, the, the later half of the panel was a lot of interesting talk on uh, common sense, like uh, uh, Yejin and Josh in particular um, looked at common sense and a lot of general ways of generalizing stuff. Yejin really focused on language as a means uh, to deal with symbolic reasoning and some of her things. Uh, like she, she looked at GT3 and morality. She looked at these open questions, how to use language as symbols. 
Um, and, and she's very, she does a lot of work on NLP um, and reasoning as a generative task as opposed to a treatment task. And a lot of the concepts, uh, a lot of the concepts were, um, a lot of the ways concepts were spoken about at this event uh, were way more coherently worded and put together than I've seen in other places. And the way people had a very, the way people had a very good interweaving of ideas from different backgrounds, like, like Aiden's been to, Aiden's like into NLP and using language as, using language as the symbols. And, and that's a lot of her work is like, how do we get to symbolic things? Okay, we're gonna use language as a model to do it through NLP. And the way she talked about it was just very interesting and really well thought out. And, and she has a really impressive, if you go to her page here, she has a really impressive uh, recent talks and, and her, her preprints and efforts. Um, like, like I, she's a really, really, really uh, impressive uh, person who does a lot of stuff that's, um, adjacent to things that we're doing um and want to do in the lab so that was an amazing talk um i really like josh Tenenbaum's talk I, I, i'm kind of i'm a general fan of his too um i really like he spoke here about um kind of making a roadmap which is very similar to our efforts and developmental periods he basically he's talking about how he wants to map out at different periods of time like okay you're a baby elementary school a bit older high school, college, and, and he, he, he explained this, this roadmap in a really nice way about how it's sort of a, a, a building trajectory of your engagement with, uh, with other worlds and other like platforms or spheres of, of knowledge and, and how, in a general point of view, um, how that works. Um, so that, that's kind of his jam in general. And speaking of jam, wow, I just unten unintentionally made one of the greatest segues I've ever made. Speaking of jam, Ash Tenenbaum mentioned classic video game, which is older, most kids don't know it, but NBA Jam, uh, which had crazy, insane two-on-two -two action and flying through the air, doing dunks across the screen. It's like an arcade game, basically. And you can't, this is not the greatest image, but you can see how, like, this is like, well, you, I don't know if it's easier to see in, in your webcam, but you have the right side, which is like, super duper you can't really even make out this is basketball but it kind of looks like it is and you go like okay more realistic more realistic more realistic, more realistic. and like the stuff that's up today is like hyper like it's super realistic and that's what we know but then he talked about how different points of view the hard problems of common sense like if you didn't have any context it might be harder to tell on the left here if we just if you just saw somebody and without me with the basket there, there's somebody doing that. Like, what are they doing? Are they playing basketball? I don't know. But, you know, from different points of view, you can see the different, the different, the, the, the different amounts of pre-existing knowledge you need to know to understand what's going on there and how that affects across the different actual quality of the representation that's being made. And so Josh talked about that in combination with, with the developmental roadmap. And I just feel like that's, that's like super relevant to a lot of the developmental AI stuff we're talking about in the lab. And it's exciting to see that there. Um, uh, this will be my closing remark. I don't know if I want to go there yet. Um, check anything else out really cool from the Slack. Oof. Jesse, are you there? Hello, uh, Rish is here. Are you there, Rishab? Uh, I think we, I think our connection died. Not really sure what happened here, but it looks like Rishab was here for a while. Uh, so I guess we'll end the meeting here. I don't know what happened to the connection, but uh, thanks everyone for attending. Uh, again, we'll next couple weeks we'll talk about the different submissions and uh, doing presentations on them. And thank you to Jesse for your presentation. I think our connection is dead, so I'll say. 
Have a good week to everyone, and hope to see you next week. Thanks for attending.